Thank you all so much for sticking around this long and for being so lovely. I hope everyone was able to have conversations and meet each other. And if you came in with zero to 100 in terms of blockchain knowledge, hopefully you learned something and we saved the best for last in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, Sheila nice. Warren, we have a history back five years now, which yeah. is nuts. We were at the World Economic Forum you, where you were heading up data policy, blockchain, you were in so many different roles of authority at this organization and dealing with, you know, a lot. So I would love to know, um, now you're the CEO at the Crypto Council for Innovation, you have so many roles around policy, regulation, you're helping to bridge the digital divide in terms of education, helping to get people on the same page when it comes to how we're approaching and talking about communities when it comes to technology. So, you know, how is it that you are navigating the current landscape in Washington? And in what ways is the Crypto Council for Innovation sort of um, changing or perhaps adapting or preparing for, for lack of a better word, their policy approach and communications um, given the upcoming elections? Okay, so am I allowed to swear? <laughs> I mean, for anyone else about Washington, I'm like, how honest are we? Really did I say this be? was supposed to be spicy? Okay, <laughs> that's right. You know, I, I, uh, where to begin? So, uh, those who are tracking this, at all, uh, will know that we are in a unique time in Washington, D.C. Uh, I would not say unprecedented because I think most of us have seen Hamilton and we know that there used to be literal duels in the streets. You know, So we're not quite there, but it's kind of the uh, 2024 version of that is happening uh, in Congress. Uh, we are in an election season that is unprecedented, to say the least, uh, where much pre-convention, we kind of know, you know who the candidates are apparently going to be and we're sort of in a a different mode in terms of what is this campaign going to look like and how is this going to shake out. And um, I am occasionally a betting person, but I personally would not be betting on this election uh, to go any which way. I think it is very unpredictable. Um, I also think, I mean, just to part of a global perspective, you know, we are in a year in 2024 of unprecedented number of elections mm -hmm. in the world, right? And not all of those are democratic. Some of them are, you know, democratic, okay? Nevertheless, there's a possibility of either a transition of power in some very significant economies and geographies or an entrenchment of a faux democratic principled uh, government, right? Uh, I'll just flag India as a very classic example of this, right? So we started with Taiwan, uh, which I actually think was a somewhat surprising outcome to some folks, um, where they elected somebody who was actually quite civil liberties minded, which is very interesting in Taiwan, given the region there, right? And we're going to proceed all the way through the course of the year. And like every few weeks, there's a meaningful election happening somewhere. So we're in a time of a lot of change, okay? Now, how we think about this from a policy perspective is, look, I mean, I have the same principles I came into at the forum, uh, which feels like a lifetime ago, by the way. It was only two years ago. It feels like forever ago. Uh, which are it, the crucial things are the things we've been talking about here today. Right? It, it's about embedding not just consumer protection, just how it's framed in the United States, but really thinking about civil rights, civil liberties, responsibilities, obligations, accountability. Because the thing is, we are, we're in a world where those of us who believe that there are significant problems in not just our financial system in terms of exclusion, inequity, bias, um, deep, deep-rooted problems that are systemic in nature, see those same problems in the tech stack and technology, right? We see platform data extraction, we see data exploitation, all of these things as being symptomatic of the same problem, which is a concentration of power in the hands of far too few people who do not have any meaningful accountability uh, to the rest of us, okay? And, um, as somebody who now has kind of like moved in and out of these worlds where, you know, we've been in rooms with all kinds of folks with all kinds of power who think about that power in very different ways. This is something I've been observing in civic tech and philanthropy for two decades, right? The idea that as philanthropy stepped in and started to erode sort of public goods and public good infrastructure, you suddenly had major verticals, infrastructure, healthcare, education, that were getting pulled to the provenance of you know, billionaire philanthropists who may or may not have had a civic-minded approach to their orientation to these problems. Okay, so that's the backdrop, okay? How I think about this is we have a, I really believe, once in a generation chance to embed some of the principles that matter into policy. Mm -hmm. Because um, we did that with the early days of the internet to some success, right? I think we can all agree that that was mixed, uh, but it was certainly, I think, a pretty good outcome for what we knew at the time. 
we're now in a world where I think that the advent of D-Web technology is completely inevitable. I think they are so superior in so many axes that actually matter to consumers, to citizens, to just everybody, really, that they're inevitable. But what is that going to look like? Is it going to wind up being a revolution that happens from the top down, from the bottom up? How are we going to kind of try to create a narrative thread across all those different layers of constituency that is consistent and that, again, is focusing on civil rights, civil liberties, all the things that really matter to humanity, um, I would argue also to the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a little bit of a vague answer, but I think it's important to take a little bit of a, of a holistic approach to the question, because how that manifests in specific you know, interventions that we're logging is dependent on the political environment, on you know, the allies, on the way that influence is crafted in different mm -hmm. political and, and policy ecosystems, which is quite different. We're a global organization. We're operational in you know, London and Brussels, in France, in Germany, in um, Washington, D.C., New York, California, Hong Kong, Singapore, you know, all these various places. And the approach is very different depending on what you're starting with, like how the pan has been seasoned, then you know what ingredients you're going to throw into it to make you know, to get these outcomes affected. Yeah, I mean, given the global perspective that CCI is really taking in a robust way, right? And you mentioned, you know, I saw that that number about what over half of the world population yeah. is going to be voting this year, which is crazy. I mean, as with the advent of you know more innovations with respect to artificial intelligence and seeing that connection with blockchain that you know we were talking about earlier with Marta, you talk a lot about yeah. sort of not seeing these technologies in their silos of excellence, but more That's so right. this constellation, right? So you know you had a really good analogy in the way that you explain <laughs> it, and I know that you explained it a lot in the past, but I think it would be really helpful for people to understand how you sort of see technology stacked interconnected. And also to add to that question, how do you then see, do you, do you see generative AI having any sort of role mm, in right, the upcoming yeah. elections, right? Ah, that's a different question. Okay, yeah. so let, let me talk about the, uh, the stack. And so I, I think in the policy space, I think policymakers tend to talk about, but also think about uh, tech policy in a very siloed way. So they're like, oh, we need AI policy, and we need you know, cyber security policy, and we need policy about, oh my god, what the hell is spatial computing? Maybe we finish that. You know, we need policy on, on blockchain and crypto and all these things, right? And look, there is some merit to that. And so the analogy I think you're, I think you're referring to, which I, I literally hope this because I was really hungry on a stage. Okay? So <laughs> like, I was really hungry. But I'm like, we, she we, it? it's, <laughs> it's important. Like, we can talk about, you know, those are like the tomatoes and the lettuce mm -hmm. and the bun and the protein or whatever, right? And like, there is value. I'm a Californian. I like to know where my tomatoes are from, you know, so sue me, right? Like, th there's value to that. But at some point, you also have to say, well, we're constructing a sandwich. Like, we're actually making a whole thing, and all these things go together, and they have a role to play. And that's how I describe, like, a tech stack to someone who has no idea what the hell that is, or, like, what is a tech stack? You know, is it a stack? Is it? I'm like, well, it's kind of like this. And in policy, you have to think about it similarly, because the policies you embed that you think are just about AI, well, look, actually, as it turns out, D-Web tech, Web3 technologies, a blockchain in some cases, can actually be a partial solution to the problem you're trying to solve. You don't need to have a policy intervention be the only thing that can solve the problem, right? Things like bias or whatever it might look like. You can actually use technology as a way to address some of those issues. And then you can layer in policy on top of that to make sure, again, like you're I use the seasoning the pan a lot so that the right things, there's a readiness for the right kinds of things to come together. So I, I talked a lot in Switzerland recently in Davos just about, um, I called it the hamburger at that time. Then I was like, that's not really inclusive. I should probably call it the sandwich, you know? But thinking about that, that puts you in a very different mindset, right? So it's interesting talking to people in Brussels because they're like, well, we had Mika. So we've kind of like dealt with crypto. <laughs> now we're going to have like the AI act. And it's like, but those things are, what are you talking about right now? They're completely related, right? So this awareness is something that sounds very basic, but just like I think a lot of technologists, are, they don't necessarily think about outside their silo as well. There are a lot of folks in an engineering team that are going to be focusing very narrowly on what they're meant to be coding and building, right? And it's only when you kind of come up a layer that you're like, oh, well, this all fits into a much broader thing. And as you get more senior in that role, you understand mm -hmm. all of those. This is just true of like human nature. Well, for policymakers, a lot of them, tech policy is new, right? They don't necessarily understand. And then tech is changing so fast that keeping up is basically impossible. So seeing that intersectionality 
is important. Now, I should say I'm, you know, I'm a student. I went to Harvard Law School, and I studied critical race theory under Lonnie Guineer, who was a mentor of mine until she passed. And so I come to this with this concept of intersectionality and thinking about systems in an intersectional and holistic way is the only way to really do this effectively. And so to me, there's no difference. And a lot of that approach, I think, is actually has informed my approach to how I think about policy in general, but also technology policy. Now, on the Gen AI question in mm -hmm. elections, I mean, yes, the answer is, of course, absolutely 100% yes. Now, the interesting thing, I think, is that a lot of the sort of um, concerns around Gen AI are because because of elections, right? They're like, oh my God, what are the Russians gonna do this time? Or, you know, is the Trump campaign gonna somehow do it? I don't know, whatever, you know, something. Are we gonna get all these deep fakes around Biden or it, it, all this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, <laughs> like, well, of course, right? Like, that's not, I mean, yes, we are, right? We did last time, we're going to this time, <laughs> overtly. And what do you do about that? And so I think that the, I actually think that there's a time race happening okay. because the reality is, as you've heard today from people who are far more experts at the, at the technology than I, you know, there is a hedge. You can actually use an underlying blockchain for accountability around AI, and Marta said this really, really well. So I won't repeat that content, but that is really important. But we're not quite there yet. And by the way, the election is like five seconds away and sort mm -hmm. of like the time scale that we're talking about here, right? It's, it's really, really coming up very fast. And this kind of content, now that we're in this world where, I mean, like, Nikki Haley, like, hang in there, you know, like, <laughs> drain those coffers, baby. But like, we know what's <laughs> happening here. We know who the candidates are going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's going to be a pivot, I think, over to a different kind of content for a longer period of time than we have had in an American election in a long time. Because normally people are battling it out to the convention. You only have a matter of months before you're kind of in a general. We're pretty much in a general, like, now, right? So, um, I think we have to be very mindful of it. We're definitely using it as a kind of a wedge when we go into Congress or wherever to talk about the challenges here. But we basically take it completely for granted that yes, Gen AI is gonna play a role. No, it's probably not gonna be positive. You know, and it's gonna be very tough to spot. And by the time you spot it, the imprint's already been made in the minds of the voting population. So, sorry, it's very sad. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to turn around. Turn around. Yeah, turn around, turn around, turn around, yes. Um, no. um, but you mentioned Micah earlier. You know, a lot of, yeah, lot yeah. of people know, don't really know what that is, but I want to kind of get back no high level with the regular. <laughs> I mean, I'll save you. But um, in terms of the regulatory piece, I think it's really important and also interesting to kind of you know, hear your perspective on do you see the same delays with AI regulation that unfortunately we've seen in the crypto space? And that doesn't take away from the fact that, you know, two, three years ago, we couldn't even see crypto movement on, on the Hill at all. And now at least people are talking about it, but there's still that delay. Do you see that happening in AI? I, I don't, and uh -huh. I don't think that's good, though. Yeah. Right? I, I mean, yeah. I actually think there's a, you can definitely regulate too early. I mean, I mm -hmm. used to call this premature regulation, which is somewhat cheeky, um, but that's kind of how I think about it, right? Like, I don't know, I don't know. You heard it so, here first. I already asked for so, you know, <laughs> we're, we're going there, friend. So, you know, I think um, that's what I used to call it behind the scenes at WEF. I kind of published that once, and I was like, I said it. Um, but, you know, I think um, it, it's true, right? Because that's very problematic, because especially because, like I just said, a lot of policymakers, and this is to very much their credit, you have to remember, like most policymakers, they have a gigantic swath of topics, okay? So I walk into a senator's office and I'm chit-chatting with them, and like the next meeting after me is like housing policy, then it's fentanyl, then it's national security, then it's you know railroads. Like there's just so many things they have to track, and they don't have an expert on every single thing, okay? So so technology, you know, crypto in particular, blockchain, that's like a teeny tiny thing on one person's portfolio that they already have like 20 other things on. So they need like quick, fast understanding of what is, what is useful and what is not. Mm -hmm. And when you have a world where this election thing, you know, it's, it's not unlike sort of, well, FTX, like we'll invoke the specter, right? So when that thing happened, there's like, we gotta do a thing, we gotta solve it, we gotta fix it, we gotta fix it, um, that kind of came up. And similarly here, it's like, well, we have to get ahead of AI before the elections, which like, mm -hmm. the, that's not a thing, that you can't do that, right? But, mm -hmm. but there's this sense that we're responding in real time to things. So like I say, whenever you do regulation hastily, you wind up regulating for a use case that is not even, it's like the tip of the iceberg of what you really need to be thinking about, and it's not done in a really thoughtful manner. So now, I think you're trying to contrast, though, the European approach, basically, yeah. right, with like the American approach. And so I will say, in the United States, it's not that there's not will to do a thing, okay? Like, there is a lot, there's actually a tremendous amount of deep knowledge and understanding on the part of congressional staffers, and I'd say less so, but some in the White House about 
uh, Web3 technologies, AI, all this stuff. It's not that there's a lack of knowledge in some cases. It's that the, the political process is just a shit show, okay? <laughs> <laughs> which is the word I knew I'd land at some point. I don't know how to describe this. But you know, you know this, right? And if you don't know it in the sort of tech space, you know it because you've seen 15 votes to get a speaker. You've seen multiple rounds of trying things that are completely basic that can't get done. A budget can't get passed. I mean, these are fundamental foundational things that normally are relatively effortless and sort of perfunctory pro forma votes that can't happen. Okay, so we are in an environment where uh, even if there were political will, which again, I believe that there is from some very important influential people in Congress on various committees and whatnot, things aren't moving because things aren't moving. It's not that our thing is not moving, it's that nothing is moving, right? So I think people on Twitter or whatever, or X or whatever you call it, you know, social media tend to get very, take it very personally. Well, our stuff is not moving and we're not getting any attention. Well, it's like, well, welcome to the show. Like that's what everyone is dealing with, mm -hmm. right? And I would argue that things like national security in Ukraine and you know, these are things that probably should take priority, with all due respect to all of us, including my job, you know, over some of the things that we see as number one priority, right? Because they are crucial to actually preserving world, the world order in any meaningful way that we think is not going to kind of give it over to autocrats and possibly fascists. So anyway, that's a very political point. But the point is, none of those things are going, okay? So the idea that we're somehow gonna escape that is, is a very naive one. Okay, meanwhile, in Europe, let's not forget, I mean, like, I think when you joined Web, like, so Mika was like, it was like five, six years in the making. It was just quietly behind the scenes. And when it emerged, it's this massive, gigantic, gargantuan, mm -hmm. comprehensive piece of regulation. And it, it, it includes some things, it carves out some things, but it was five years plus, actually, of negotiation to get that thing across the line. It just emerged into the popular awareness in the United States because most Americans are not paying attention to European policy, which they should. Right? And so we were very much tracking it when I was at WEF and, and now. Um, but that's kind of where things are in AI. And so the thing to understand is a lot of folks, the minute Mika was kind of like hit sort of escape velocity where they knew it was going to go, they turned to AI. Mm -hmm. So the AI conversations might seem very new. They've been going on for three years in Europe. Right now, for better or for worse, I think the AI Act is not good. I think it's like a Frankenstein thing that pulls together a bunch of threads that don't really necessarily make sense together. However, you know, there was a lot of negotiation that went into that, and it was not reactive in the way I think we're seeing the American approach be, even though, again, I do not believe it is a powerful piece of regulation that is necessarily useful for the things I think we in this room care about. Nevertheless, you cannot argue that there was a process underlying that. Okay? So those are the differences, I think, that matter. And so when I look at you know, the EU in particular, and I look at us, we're tracking very closely what's gonna happen with the EP. There's a mm -hmm. lot of people up for turnover and turnover possibilities there, right? How are they gonna think about technology? A lot of them are younger. They're gonna have more nativity with some of these um, technologies and more mm -hmm. familiarity with it. That's gonna be, maybe it's helpful, maybe it's not. Like we have to see, right? So all of that, um, again, we're in this year where in the end of this year, we're gonna have a much different slate and a much different Again, to go back to this, like ridiculous, like the panel will be seasoned in a different way because mm -hmm. the folks that are going to be in the positions of power to make decisions are going to be different people with different contexts and understandings and backgrounds and priorities and all of that. And so you have to kind of you have to take what you get, right? So you have to adjust to the people who are there and make the case to those people that what you care about is important. Absolutely, yeah. That's why it's an exhausting job. <laughs> I will pivot away from yeah. the policy conversation. Are you still with me? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, you absolutely have significant experience, obviously, in the nonprofit sector. In our work at the forum, you always made it a point to ensure that we bring all of the voices that, unfortunately, the forum doesn't have the most experience or <laughs> reputation <laughs> doing, at least very well. Um, and, you know, we did that. We did that on the data policy platform. We did that on blockchain. We worked with amazing communities. And equity was a huge part of that work. Um, and I still know that that's a big part of the work at CCI, despite its heavy policy, yeah. you know, uh, reputation. So. so would love to hear from you, obviously, the equity and community work that you're doing at CCI that perhaps we don't hear that much about. And some of the use cases that you're seeing that you're particularly excited about. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Veen. I mean, I think, you know, um, for those who aren't familiar, so I spent 10 years, actually more than that, in civic tech. And so um, after I left corporate law, 
I moved out here, and you know, some of my clients were you know, moveon.org when they set up their first PAC. Um, I worked with a bunch of different progressive, different movements, some of which still exist, some of which don't. Very, very early cannabis banking movement. Those were all my clients, right? And when I was a, a lawyer at a law firm called Adler and Colvin. And so, um, and then I went to a place called TechSoup, where the job was really training uh, nonprofit, like small, tiny nonprofits, like not the big giant ones, but like the small uh, and medium-sized civil society organizations, on like what is technology, how do I use it? We had this hilarious like, what is the cloud? Where is the cloud? You know, is that that <laughs> timing right to give you a sense mm -hmm. of when this was? So I was general counsel there and an exec, and I launched a SaaS, a B two B SaaS product called NGO Source. And so it's always been the case that, you know, to me, it's not just civil society that really matters. It's actually smaller organizations that are very grassroots oriented in nature that have a different voice. And so my, my product, just to kind of go into this, not to be, to give you a sense of the background and why this matters so much to me, was designed to basically divert funds away from the Red Cross, Red Crescent uh, around disaster. The impetus and why I wanted to build this product was to get those to actually grassroots local organizations. So this was after Haiti um, that would have more, not just credibility, but like we're more committed to rebuilding and reconstruction in the countries that were suffering from disaster because the Red Cross Red Crescent model is very effective along with the military, which is what widely known, in the wake of disaster to kind of get like the food, the water, the whatever, but then they just vanish and there's no infrastructure left behind. So to me, I felt like empowering those organizations that were committed, that were local, that were, that were there, right, to kind of do that work mattered a lot. And so how could we make it cheaper for them to get funding? How could we help use technology to help them with their missions? Like all of that was something that was, was crucial to me and remains really important to me. So anyhow, so all that being said, when I got to the forum, you know, it was uh, not surprising. I mean, fair enough. Mm -hmm. I knew what I was getting mm -hmm. into. But civil society is sort of a, a little bit of a box check there. And I'll just say it. I know you don't feel like saying it, but I'll certainly say it because we're not there anymore. Um, and to me, bringing in different voices was really important. So we do that at CCI as well. And you're right. One of the bummers about my job is I don't get to talk about that quite as much as the sort of policy work that I get asked about all the time, because that's the core function that we have right now in this moment. But my hope is that once we've landed some of the major regulatory moments that are inevitable and need to happen over the next couple of years, you know, we can move back into talking more about this work that's happening a little bit under the hood. And so we do have a research division, uh, and we, we got a grant to actually do a bunch of work thinking about builders of color in crypto and their communities. Like, what are people doing with the blockchain and with crypto? Um, and you know, unsurprisingly, it turned out that builders of color are doing two things. So uh, one is, uh, the use cases are twofold. One is remittances, they're sending money home. The other is um, they're gaining capital. They're actually getting access to capital they can't get from a traditional venture you know, model or they're not historically wealthy, they can't bootstrap a company. So those are the two things. But then what they're doing with it is community generation and creation. Mm -hmm. They're actually tracking and creating communities online in new ways. And you've heard again from other people talking a lot about this, um, and that accountability and that visibility is proving to be really powerful in movement building, right? Which is what we're kind of all talking about here is movement building. Uh, so to me, I feel like that's fundamentally what this space is about and what I think, whether you want to call it DWeb or Web3 or even blockchain-based technologies, depending on who you are and what audience you're with, mm -hmm. I think they all have fundamentally the same concept, which is it's a different way of organizing power. It's a different way of solidifying power it's a different way of creating an accountability within systems that is robust and that has longevity to it, right? That, it, that can have the longevity that the community decides it needs for whatever reason it needs it for. And to me, that is a foundational moment. And so part of what I want to preserve when I say civil rights and civil liberties, it's not just how we traditionally understand those things in traditional power structures. It's reimagining what structures would look like without the sort of top-down power hierarchy that we're so, that's so familiar. If we had more open systems, if we had more democratic, I'll use that word, although it's, like I said, I already did this, right? <laughs> if we had those systems really in place, what might that movement building look like? What might that accountability look like? And the blockchain is designed perfectly to actually be very customizable and configurable to whatever it is that communities really think that they want. So that is work that I think is kind of like, it's not the, the what I lead with because it's very, I think it always comes across as threatening to anybody in a government, right? I mean, I mean the, the minute you talk about this stuff, like you don't, I don't go into like Congress and say, we're talking about different movements of power, you know? They're like, what the hell? You know, that's not really what I, but I think that if you understand this even a little bit, you get that that is foundationally what it is about, in my opinion, okay? Um, and so it's always sort of there. And I think it's just a matter of time before we can start talking about that more openly and more directly in policy conversations. There are some folks we can do that with. There are some you know, progressives and even frankly some libertarians we can do that with. But for the most part, it is not, it's not what you lead with. Right, so. right. 
Well, we have, um, we're near at time, so I want to close with this. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not going to say, you know, step into your Yoda moment and give us parting words of wisdom <laughs> because every moment was a Yoda moment. But I um, would love to know um, what are, you know, maybe one to two key insights or maybe an overarching insight that you feel would be, you know, helpful for this group to walk away with from this event? You know, I think when I was kind of going through um, my notes and things I jotted down, and as I was sitting in George's, George's workshop, thanks, um, you know, it is, this takes time, right? And, and I think there is, I don't feel it in this group because I think we all know that the things we care about take time, they have taken time, and it's hard to not be impatient and frustrated. I'm frustrated all the time, Maskevine. <laughs> You know, like, why does this take so long? Why is it Lots so hard? Why is it so yeah. hard, right? <laughs> so hard. But it is hard, and it does take time. And so I think that the time scale is important. And it's not, I'm not saying be patient. I don't, whatever. Be, be as patient as you are prone to be. That's a personality question, right? But I, I do think recognize that there are a lot of little wins that are happening. There is movement that is happening. It is very, very observable to me from where I sit. I hope it's observable to you. And so on the days you want to beat your head against a wall, which is many of them, you know, I think just recognition of that and that what we're doing is a proposition that when I think about this, I feel like it's a relay, right? Like, so people are always like, what do you want your legacy to be? And I'm like, well, I want my legacy to be movement. I don't need like a moment that's like, Sheila Warren and CCI did that thing, whatever. That's not a thing I think about. It's like, did we move the baton? Did it move? Who am I passing it to? How are we building the next generation of people that are taking this forward, that understand what this is about? And when I'm in rooms like this, I feel so positive and excited because there are so many people that are doing this in all of our, our different ways, right? And we have the ability, again, to organize as a movement more than we've had before. It, it takes a little bit actually less effort and labor with the tech that we have now to do some of that organizing than it took in the past when it was really about sitting in a circle, having a conversation, doing a phone tree. It's like, there's no phone tree. You're just like, you know, signal chatting the, all your people, right? So there's so much efficiency that I think we miss because the work is so hard and it does take so long. And there aren't necessarily these concrete moments of like, that's our win, we got it, we're done now. Like, that's not a thing that we're gonna experience. So to me, it's like putting that sort of expectation to the side. There's no like, when we do this, it's done. There is, we can pass the baton to the next person. Uh, the other thing that I've been thinking a lot about lately, in part because I read, I'm gonna, I knew I was gonna forget her name. There's a book called Rest is Resistance. Yeah. It's so good, it's just so good. And so I refer to it a lot because the reality is that you can burn out faster now than I think you could in the past because there's so much coming at us, right? There's so much coming at everyone all the time. And so the idea that you have to look out for yourself and your community and you have to make sure that you're being mindful of your own needs and your own pauses and your own, um, you're not taking everything on your shoulders, mm -hmm. right? There is a, I think Danny said this so well in the lead up to our session, there are, there are so many people in this with you, and we're doing this together. And it may not be obvious how we're all moving the same direction, but again, that is happening. So I don't know if that's like the UN moment or whatever, but I, I definitely, that is what I'm taking away from today. Mm -hmm. And it's really energizing to be among all of you. And I'm very grateful to you for all the work that you do. With that, yeah. Sheila Warren. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.